guys, and welcome to the Moms and Mysteries podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I'm doing well. We just spoke yesterday to each other, so yeah, I'm still doing well. I was doing really? Because well 24 doing hours is a <laughs> lot of time for things to go awry, at least in my life. <laughs> well, you know, I'm getting ready to go on our family vacation for the summer, Yay. so I feel like I'm in that that state where like I'm I don't know manic maybe like yeah, I just no, feel like I, I have so much to do and I'm like I'm excited but I'm also like just all over the place so yeah so that's where I'm at I feel like I'm exactly the same as I was yesterday which was also manic well. and crazy <laughs> 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 yeah how about you Melissa I'm doing well nothing really exciting going on my daughter started conditioning for volleyball which is exciting because you know volleyball is my favorite season um I mean, it's not a season, but it's kind of a season <laughs> here. And so I'm excited for that. I love watching her play. Nothing else is going on. Did I tell you my foot? Yeah, I told you my son broke his foot literally the day after we recorded. So thankfully, he's not on crutches anymore because that was truly a nightmare for oh everyone around him. Just imagine him with crutches. They're just going in opposite directions. I'm like, you're going to break your neck. That's going to be the next thing. This is terrible. So he's in a boot, which is great. Um, except he doesn't want to wear it. So, you know, <laughs> of just course. life with yeah. kids, right? Yeah, I can't imagine. Um, honestly, I can't imagine either one of my kids having to be on crutches either. I feel like not only would they not use them properly, but then they would also use them intentionally, improperly, like to beat oh, yeah. each other with, you know, with Absolutely. The, each crutch. So, yeah. <laughs> I saw one fly across the room and I was like, was that aimed at someone? I right. don't understand what happened. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a dangerous thing to put in the hands of children. <laughs> yes, for sure. Uh, but the volleyball, volleyball, what did you call it? Conditioning? Sounds yeah. super fun. Um, well, yeah, you would like that. It's yeah, what, is like it, what does it out. actually entail? What do they have to do? I mean, they're just doing like uh, different running drills. It's like all those running squats, all those things that kind of help you um, during the year. So my daughter was like, I am so sore. And I was like, oh, it's yeah. amazing when you stop, you know, doing something like how hard it is to get back into it. And I was like, just in a few weeks, you'll be totally fine. She's like, right. But right now I am so sore. <laughs> I'm like, I and get it's it. super unfair how long it takes to get conditioned and then how, yeah. how quick it Easily. is to become mm -hmm. unconditioned to whatever it is that you're used to doing. It's crazy how fast if you stop doing it, like, it's nowhere oh, near sure. as it happens way faster than it does whenever you're trying to get yourself conditioned to something. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. she's excited. I'm excited. She's doing, um, last thing about volleyball, uh, a big camp at the college here, like where it's overnight, you stay there, the players help coach you and stuff, which is so cool. Like you stay oh, on yeah. campus. Yeah. So either she'll learn a lot of really bad habits or she'll have a really good time or both. We'll find out. Nice. Stay tuned to this space. <laughs> <laughs> and Melissa, volleyball is a track and field sport, isn't it? Mandy, you can't do this. <laughs> Don't do this to me. <laughs> it's relevant to this week's episode. This but I can't asking. hear that. I can't hear that blasphemy. <laughs> okay. So this week we have a very interesting story that I have also never heard. And it's kind it was interesting to me because I realized just how ignorant I am to the world of sports and how many of them there actually are. So if you asked me to name as many track and field sports as I could, I literally would look at you and say track. And then I would think for a second and probably say field. <laughs> and then I would just look at you until you corrected me and told me that there were actually dozens of track and field events, and I had just never heard of them. Uh, so before you sit there and think to yourself, wow, Mandy, you really are pretty dumb. I just want to <laughs> point out <laughs> that in my defense, people my height don't really do a lot of track and field uh -uh. things. Mm -hmm. um, I, and that's because, Melissa, being taller is advantageous in many track You're and field You're a heightist. <laughs> I'm not saying it is required in every track and field sport, but it is an advantage to be taller in many of them. So it just makes sense to me that I might not know so much about those types of sports, right? <laughs> so if it doesn't directly involve people your size, 
<laughs> you say forget it. I, I will not even put this in my brain. <laughs> well, I would never like look into it. As soon as I sure, realize sure, it's sure. all tall people, I'm like, nope, that's not for me. I'm yeah. <laughs> immediately immediately out. Immediately now. <laughs> so anyway, somewhere on the long list of sports that I didn't really know much about is the sport of shot putt. And I feel like I've heard those words at some point in my life put together, but I never knew what it exactly was. And I definitely didn't know what this sport entailed until just this week. So I ended up spending at least at least a half an hour, maybe even longer on YouTube watching footage of Olympic shot putters doing their thing. And I was absolutely fascinated. Melissa, have you ever watched shot putt? (laughs) Can I tell you, I didn't know what it was called. I've seen it, but I didn't know what it was called. It doesn't to me doesn't make sense that that's that actually the name. makes me feel better that at least it wasn't just me like what is this and then seeing it for the first time like I felt I feel like there's so few opportunities in life as an adult to like see something new for the first time <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was fascinated <laughs> oh my gosh this episode is going places <laughs> so what is shot putt you're asking well in Mandy terms People are just throwing a heavy ball across a football field. (laughs) But the real definition of shot putt, according to the Cambridge English Dictionary, is that it's a sports competition in which a heavy metal ball is thrown from the shoulder as far as possible. So it's pretty much exactly what I said. The ball is actually called the shot and putting just means throwing it. So it's called shot putt. So how heavy is this ball, do you ask? Well, men who compete in this sport are hurling a 16-pound ball, and women use one that's 8.8 pounds. And these athletes are throwing these things up to 68 and 56 feet for men and women, respectively, which I find completely insane. As somebody who lifts weights regularly, I know kind of what these weights feel like to think about picking up like a 10-pound dumbbell or an 8-pound dumbbell or a kettlebell would be a closer example and trying to throw it. I just, I was cracking up thinking of throwing it like 60 or 50 or 60 feet. That like, <laughs> there's no way I, I would I can't throw a paper airplane that far. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But shot putters, as I said, aren't even using a kettlebell with a handle. It's just a heavy metal ball. So sounds really interesting. It actually is really, really cool. Like I said, I got sucked into watching videos of it and I may have found a new sport to follow and especially in the Olympics, when the Olympics comes around. Big shot putt has gotten you. <laughs> <laughs> they really did. So as with any sport, the ultimate dream for those who play this is to make it to the Olympics. But of course, there are so few athletes that ever achieve that dream. But David Lout was one of the elite few who did get to play in the most prestigious event on earth. David Lout got his start in Ventura County, California in 1956. He was an all-star athlete at Santa Clara High School in the early to mid-70s where he excelled in football, track and field, and basketball. David had just the right genetics for sports, growing to a height of 6'3 and carrying the ability to pack on a lot of muscle. He was described as being brawny and headstrong, and he was the type of guy who could jump into just about any sport and perform well. I feel like if you are good at one sport, it it does kind of, you're kind of a lot of times good at multiple sports. It's not so crazy to move into yeah, another one. Sure. Right? Michael Jordan did yeah, it Yeah, I feel like if you're just, baseball. yeah, if you're athletic, if you have like athletic ability, I feel like it's very easy for you to, I mean, there's probably some, you're probably not going to be good at every single sport, but I imagine you'll be good at several are you saying I wasn't good at basketball because I wasn't? But are you saying that? Because that's rude. I'm just saying that it's okay if you're not great at everything. <laughs> Fine. After high school, David went to college at UCLA, where he earned a spot on the university's track team. David played shot putt, and he was very good at it. He was one of the best players in the country for eight or nine years, according to his own coach. During his time at UCLA, David earned two NCAA titles, and in 1979, he won the gold medal for shot putt at the Pan American Games, making him the top shot putter in the United States at the time. David was supposed to go to the 1980 Summer Olympics, but unfortunately, he never made it because at that time, the U.S. was boycotting the Olympics since they were being held in Moscow. In December of 1980, Dave married his wife, Jane. She was also an athlete who played volleyball, and she was the homecoming queen at the same high school Dave attended, but the two didn't start dating until college. Those who knew the couple said they seemed very much in love, and Dave was always beaming when he would talk about Jane, and he really held her up on a pedestal. Dave's mom thought Jane was absolutely wonderful as well. Even though he was married and starting this new phase of life, Dave continued to pursue his athletic passions, and in 1982, he shot the American shot putt record. 
Two years later, in 1984, he finally made it to the Olympic Games. And pretty much everyone had their money on Dave taking the gold that year, but ultimately he ended up winning the bronze. Still, the people of his hometown thought of him as a hero. And Dave was more determined than ever to return to the Olympics in 1988, but he ended up severely injuring his knees while training, leading him to retire from the sport and begin a career in teaching. Dave's first teaching job was at his own former school, Santa Clara High. He taught biology and anatomy and physiology. He also served the school's athletic department in various ways over the years, and he was the assistant track and field coach at Ventura College. While doing all of this, he worked to continue his education, and he eventually earned his master's degree in physical education. Meanwhile, Dave and Jane were hoping to start a family, but after many attempts of trying to have a baby on their own, they decided to adopt a baby from South Korea. Jane then became a stay-at-home mom, and she was described as being very soft-spoken and being devoted to her roles as mother and wife. It was on August 27, 2009, when tragedy struck the Lout family. At about 11.30 that night, Jane dialed 911 from the Lout home and told the operator that there was possibly an intruder and that she heard gunshots. The operator asked Jane if they had any weapons in the home that the officer should be aware of, and Jane said that all their guns were locked inside of a gun safe. Jane said that she and her 10-year-old child were inside the house, and her husband David had gone outside to see what was going on. She stayed on the line with the dispatcher while officers rushed to the home. When the officers arrived, they could see Jane inside the house through a window. She was still on the phone with 911, and she was crying and saying, quote, I see shadows, I see shadows. And when she referred to David, she kept saying that he didn't come back inside. Jane told the responding officers that her husband had gone out the back sliding glass door, but he had never come back in. Officers made their way to the backyard and found Dave lying face down on the ground with blood pooling around his head. He had no vital signs. Upon closer inspection, they noticed that Dave was lying on top of one of his arms, so they thought that it was possible Dave was holding a gun in the hand that they couldn't see and that he had taken his own life. Jane once again stated that all of their guns were locked up in a safe, and she asked if her husband was okay. The officer informed her that Dave had been shot, possibly self-inflicted, and that he was sadly dead. When Jane heard the news, she seemed dazed and confused, and she just kept repeating he was shot, as if she just really couldn't comprehend what she had just been told. Jane was asked whether or not she and Dave had any marital problems, or if there was anything that indicated that Dave was planning to hurt himself, and Jane said no, there was nothing that was out of the ordinary. She said they had their ups and downs like every other couple, but she saw no signs that Dave was suicidal. And we have so much more to get into after a quick break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. So before the break, we were discussing the scene that had taken place at Jane and David's house where officers have found David and they're trying to figure out the events that led up to David being shot. So a short time later, the police sergeant arrived at the scene and took a look at Dave's body. He determined that Dave had actually been shot multiple times, two of which were in the back of the head. So this eliminated this self-inflicted gunshot theory. An autopsy would later confirm that Dave was shot a total of six times. In addition to the two in the back of the head, he was shot once in the back, twice in the face, and once in the arm. One of the shots went through his brain and was likely the fatal shot. The wound from the shot showed that the gun was just an inch or two away from Dave's head when it was fired. Another wound on Dave's head appeared to be from blunt force trauma, but could have been caused by a bullet grazing the side of his head. When police went to speak with Jane to find out more about what the family was doing leading up to the shooting, they noticed that the house had no signs of any altercation that had taken place there. Jane did not have any visible injuries, nor did she complain of having any. She stated that she was inside by the sliding glass door when Dave went outside into their yard. She said that she heard Dave say, what the F, and then she heard three shots. The sergeant had other officers work to canvas the area in search of a possible shooter, but they were unable to find anyone. Neighbors of the Louts told officers that they could occasionally hear conversations coming from inside the Louts' residence. The houses were really close together, so it was kind of inevitable sometimes. But they said that on the night of the shooting, they didn't hear any voices raised or anything that sounded like fighting. They did, however, hear the gunshots. Another detective soon arrived to test for gunshot residue. 
Interestingly, when Jane saw this gunshot residue kit on the table and realized exactly what the officer was getting ready to do, she asked to get up and go to the bathroom. So this detective actually escorted her to the bathroom in her own home, and they both returned to the table. But when the detective was preparing the test kit, he noticed that Jane had actually gone off back to the bathroom. And when he went back there, he found her wiping her hands off on a towel after she appeared to have just washed them, and he told her to stop what she was doing. Jane acted startled, and she told the officer that she actually had just forgotten to wash her hands when she went to the bathroom, so that's why, you know, she went back to wash her hands. No big deal. The detective did still swab her hands for the gunshot residue, but aside from the fact that she just washed her hands, the officer also forgot to place a barcode on this kit, and it was later lost by the police. Oof. Yeah. Jane was taken to the station to be officially interviewed. She explained that her 10-year-old child had been asleep when her husband Dave heard a noise coming from out in the backyard and he went outside to investigate. Jane said that she went outside with him briefly, but then Dave actually told her to go back inside the house. And she says that's when she heard these gunshots and Dave never came back inside. Jane said that her relationship with Dave was not physically or emotionally abusive and she denied having any involvement in his death. After the interview, Jane was taken to a room where she was to remove all the clothing she had on that night so that they could be taken into evidence. While she was undressing, detectives saw two scratches on her upper left arm. One was about an inch long and the other was about a half an inch in diameter. Jane said that a dog had actually caused these scratches, but of course, in light of everything, they're just making note like, okay, maybe those were caused from some kind of combative injuries. So in the meantime, the Lout home was being searched. They found documents inside that showed financial difficulties for the couple, including letters from collection agencies and a notice of wage garnishment for unpaid taxes. Officers also found a life insurance policy in the amount of $300,000, with Dave being named as the insured and the beneficiary being listed as Jane. There were also unwashed women's clothing in the laundry machine, and that was gathered and taken in for testing. A 22 caliber revolver, interestingly, was found hidden inside of a grandfather clock in the house, and that was also taken in for testing. Officers also took a computer that was found in the home. So the clothing that was taken from the washing machine later tested positive for blood and for gunshot residue, and the bullets from the revolver were found to match the bullets recovered from Dave's body. So hours after her initial interview, Jane actually told officers she had a different story. At this point, though, Jane didn't know the officers had found the gun or the clothes, but she did admit that she had actually been the one to shoot Dave, but that she was acting in self-defense after Dave threatened to kill her and their child. Jane then asked for a lawyer, and she hired a private defense attorney. Officers were really stunned at this story. For one thing, it didn't look like Jane had been in a fight for her life at all. But despite having just admitted to shooting Dave, Jane was not arrested that night. Which blows my mind because people are arrested for a lot less. For the next five to six months, detectives conducted dozens of interviews in which they asked friends and family of the couple whether or not there were any marital distress or domestic violence issues, and everyone said no. Dave's brother and sister-in-law said they never witnessed any abuse or saw any bruises, but the sister-in-law did say that Jane had told her that Dave was verbally abusive and mean on many occasions. She did not mention anything about physical abuse during that interview. She also said the Louts had been having problems in the last year, to the point that Jane said she wanted to leave the marriage, but her main concern was their 10-year-old. There were others interviewed who also spoke about Dave being verbally abusive as well, including one of the neighbors who said she always saw Jane doing most of the housework while Dave was there bossing her around. When investigators spoke with Jane's friends, they found out that she often wore long sleeve shirts, even when it was hot outside, and that she sometimes had strange bruises that she would always explain away. Detectives also heard from interviewing people that sometimes Jane would tell really crazy stories. For example, a stalker attacked her two separate times, a man died in her arms at the bank, and she was held up knife point at a grocery store. Next, investigators hired a forensic accountant to go through the financial documents that they found in the Lout home. It was determined that Jane was actually the one responsible for the financial problems, and she had been the one that was spending money like it was going out of style. She had racked up significant debt, stopped paying their taxes, and even borrowed $60,000 from her mother-in-law, Dave's mom, over the course of several years. 
At one point, Jane actually asked her mother-in-law for $25,000 all at once, and she told her mother-in-law that if she didn't pay this $25,000, then the bank was going to actually foreclose on their home. Investigators ended up finding out that Jane took the check that her mother-in-law gave her and cashed it and then deposited $20,000 of it into the school PTA bank account, of which... Jane was the uh, treasurer of the PTA, so you can probably guess where this is going. The PTA account had actually been missing a large sum of money prior to Jane making this $20,000 deposit. And really, there's no explanation why you would deposit $20,000 of your own money into the PTA uh, no. bank account. So that How already does that even have is... that much money? That is wild to me already. Exactly. Yeah, right? No kidding. Anyway, what the school was saying and what anybody else might infer is that Jane had stolen money from the PTA first and then borrowed it from her mother-in-law right. to kind of pay it back and cover it up, probably thinking like, the PTA probably is going to call the police. My mother-in-law probably won't call the police. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. So an examination of the computer from the Lout home revealed internet searches regarding divorce and divorce attorneys that they found had been made under Dave's user account several weeks before the murder. After spending months looking into all of this, investigators were convinced that Jane's story about self-defense was just a lie. They believed that Jane actually planned Dave's murder because she knew that he was planning to leave her. Plus, she also knew about the life insurance policy. As for the abuse, investigators thought Jane was exaggerating or maybe even completely making it up. In February 2010, about 10 months after the shooting, Jane was charged with first-degree murder with a firearm enhancement that basically said, you know, she personally and intentionally discharged a firearm which caused death. Immediately after her arrest, Jane's lawyer told the media that Jane had shot Dave in self-defense, and she started to really paint Dave as this woman and child abuser, and even showed photos of Jane with bruises on her body that were allegedly taken after Dave was killed and were meant to show that he, you know, had been violent towards her. Jane and Dave's child went to live with Jane's brother after she was arrested. Jane was eventually released on $1 million bond, and she remained a free woman for the next six years while authorities prepared for trial. Right before Jane went on trial, she actually did an interview with 48 Hours. Jane maintained in this interview that she had never planned to kill Dave, but it was the only way to stop him from coming after her. She said that the abuse had escalated to a point she had never experienced before that night. Jane said she first saw Dave's alleged temper when they were dating. She said, quote, there were signals I didn't really pay attention to before. Just his anger, his, you know, if something didn't go right, if he couldn't find something, if he's throwing away a shot and it doesn't go as far as he wants, he's just losing his temper, end quote. She alleged that it was shortly after their wedding when Dave first physically assaulted her. She said he was going out of town for Olympic training and he hit her because she forgot to buy something for him to pack. Furthermore, Jane said that all those crazy stories that she would tell people, like the stalker or being held at knife point, were really just to explain away the abuse she was enduring at Dave's hand. She also said that that money she borrowed from her mother-in-law was not because she had stolen money from the PTA. No, of course not. It was because Dave had thrown the money into the fireplace in a fit of anger. So we're saying that Dave was so mad, he threw $25,000 into the fireplace and you're already having financial problems? So 48 Hours asked Jane to elaborate. They asked if he burned all the money in cash and she said no, that he used some of the money to pay off the mortgage, which was a few months behind, which also makes sense when you think of the $20,000 that she deposited and there was $5,000 left over. That's just my personal opinion. When asked why the couple was in so much debt, Jane said she really had no idea. She said she paid for bills, groceries, and tuition, and that Dave, quote, ordered a lot of stuff, end quote. All right. So in this 48 Hours interview, Jane said that Dave wasn't always physically abusive towards her. She said most of the time he just called her names and psychologically abused her. She said that he called her terrible names every day for the last two years of his life, and he would taunt her and their child with his gun collection and even forced Jane to play Russian roulette. She claimed that she stayed with him because she thought things would get better, but she said that she regretted keeping their child in that situation. When speaking about the night of the murder, Jane told 48 Hours that she and her child came home late after being at the beach all day, and Dave was allegedly already at home and had been drinking all evening. 
So when Jane and her child got back, Jane apparently did not ask Dave how his day was, which she said caused him to blow up. And Dave accused Jane and their child of just not respecting him. Jane said that she took their child to bed and tried to calm them down because they were really scared. And she said the next thing that she remembered was she heard Dave, what she called raging in the hallway, and said that she could see him coming towards them with a gun in his hand. Next, Jane said that she lured Dave out of the house to get him away from their child. The two of them stumbled to the side of the house and Jane suddenly felt the gun go off and both of them fell to the ground. After that, she remembers straddling over Dave, but she said she doesn't remember anything else. Jane said that when she got up, she didn't even think Dave was dead. She thought for some reason he was still just going to get up and run after her. She said she doesn't know why she didn't tell the 911 operator any of this when she called them, and she denied knowing anything about Dave looking up divorce attorneys in the weeks leading up to his murder as well. Dave's sister-in-law wasn't buying any of it. This is his brother's wife. She told 48 Hours that she had never heard anything about Dave being physically abusive towards Jane, and furthermore, she thinks that everything Jane said about any verbal abuse was a lie as well. According to 48 Hours, before Jane went to trial, she and her defense attorneys turned down five plea deals. The last one would have had her plead guilty to manslaughter and serve six years in prison, which could be cut in half with good behavior. But she did not take the deal. She said, quote, I felt if I took the plea, nobody would know what really happened. It would be like accepting what the prosecution said happened that night. It would be like accepting that they said there was no abuse with our child or me. And we have more to get into after one last break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. So before the break, we are talking about Jane going to trial for the murder of her husband, Dave. She has been offered several plea deals, and she has turned them all down, including one that could have had her in prison for less than six years. So Jane finally goes to trial on January 11th, 2016, where her case was heard by a jury of six men and six women. The jury was instructed to consider multiple verdicts, including first-degree murder, second-degree murder, or acquittal, meaning that they believe she acted in self-defense. Jane's trial actually lasted for eight weeks. Prosecutors told the jury that Jane killed Dave in a willful, deliberate, and premeditated way, that this was not self-defense. They alleged that she did it because she knew he was planning to divorce her and she wanted his life insurance money. They believe that on the night of the murder, Jane lured David to the side yard of their home after secretly arming herself with a fully loaded revolver. When they were next to the house in an unlit area, Jane shot Dave at close range and then went back inside the house and hid the weapon in the bottom of the grandfather clock. Then she changed her clothes and dialed 911. They said that Jane had lied to the police from the moment they arrived at the scene. The prosecutors also had an expert explain the mechanics of the gun used to kill Dave and pointed out that a single action revolver such as the one used in this case has to be reset before each shot, meaning that Jane had to pull the hammer back before pulling the trigger each time. Lastly, the shots to the back of Dave's head show that the shooting was not defensive. Members of the Lout family, as well as many friends, testified that they never saw any sign of violence and described Dave as being a loving family man and a hometown hero. Unfortunately, prosecutors did engage in a little bit of misconduct during the trial that ended up with a $500 fine. And here is just a list of some of the things that they did. So for one, during the argument phase of trial, the prosecutor told the jury that Jane had six years to prepare her testimony and that she had been coached. Defense counsel objected the use of the word coached, and they said that it was misconduct to use that word, implying that counsel told Jane what to say. So the judge told the jury to just disregard the word coached, which is always something so interesting because you can't really unhear something that you've heard. I so know. it is kind of crappy if you're in that situation and the judge is like, yeah, you're right. Like, really, you shouldn't have said that. We'll tell them to disregard it. But like, they've already heard, you know, they've heard that. So it's right. kind of, you can't unring a bell kind of thing. It's, yeah. So uh, during the rebuttal argument phase, the prosecutor told the jury, quote, as a defense attorney, you've got to understand people's roles. Everyone has their roles and he is representing his client. His client is on trial for murder. He must come up and make an argument to confuse, to distract and to mislead you. 
Later, the prosecution again said that the defense attorney's job was to mislead, distract, and confuse. And the prosecutor also presented a PowerPoint presentation to the jury, which included the statement that the defense counsel was, quote, doing his job to mislead and distract the jury. So the judge did tell the jury that what the prosecution said about the defense attorney misleading them was incorrect and it was misconduct. I guess you can't just go up there and say to the jury, like, hey, this guy's a liar. You <laughs> They're know, liars. He's lying. <laughs> They're lying to you. Um, so the judge did tell the jury to completely disregard those statements, and he ordered them to be stricken from the record. But again, you can't really undo it. So Jane's defense stuck to the self-defense excuse and claimed that the lies Jane told the police were a classic symptom of battered woman syndrome. Jane testified that Dave was verbally and physically abusive towards her since early on in their marriage and that the physical abuse included beatings and rapes. She said that the abuse increased in the months leading up to the shooting. Jane said that Dave was an awful man who was very hateful and even racist towards their adopted child. And by the time the summer of 2009 rolled around, things were extremely tense in their household. She explained in detail what happened that night and how she had been trying to get Dave away from their child as he was threatening her with a gun. She told the jury she believed Dave was going to kill them, so she shot him several times and then she went to hide the gun. At this point, though, she said she didn't think Dave was dead and she called 911 still thinking that he was just badly hurt. Jane did admit to lying to the police about there being an intruder, but she said that she just wanted to buy herself time for her and her child to get out. Some of Jane's neighbors and relatives did testify in her defense that Dave was abusive towards her and their child. They said they saw injuries on Jane's body and noticed that she went out of her way to wear concealing clothing, even in hot weather. Jane and Dave's child, who was 17 by this time, also testified for their mom, stating that Dave had a bad temper, yelled a lot, and called them names. They did say they couldn't recall any physical violence, though. A psychologist named Dr. Katherine Emmerich testified that she saw Jane the evening after the shooting for the first time, and her evaluation was that Jane suffered from battered woman syndrome and PTSD, as well as major depression, anxiety, avoidant personality disorder, and dependent personality disorder. According to Dr. Emmerich, Jane received six years of therapy after the shooting, and over that time, she recounted hundreds of incidents of abuse from Dave, including verbal, physical, and sexual abuse, as well as death threats. After six years of therapy, Dr. Emmerich said that Jane was no longer suffering from PTSD and was partially in remission. Licensed social worker Gail Pincus testified as an expert on PTSD and battered women syndrome. Pincus had interviewed Jane three times. She concluded that Jane was the victim of battered women syndrome. Pincus said Dave isolated Jane from her family and friends and abused her emotionally and physically. Pincus also testified that a person suffering from battered women syndrome can lose executive function, aka the reasoning part of your brain. The judge did not allow any expert testimony on the effects of battered women syndrome on Jane's state of mind at the time of the attack. After deliberating for four days, the jury found Jane guilty of first degree murder. She was sentenced to 25 years plus another 25 years for the firearm enhancement. Dave's brother and his two children gave victim impact statements where they described the devastating loss of their brother, uncle, best friend, and hero. Each of them also said to Jane that they forgave her. The family stated that not only did they have to suffer the tragic loss of Dave in the prime of his life, but then they were forced to endure hours of lies attacking his character after he was no longer around to defend himself. Dave's sister-in-law said, quote, I would like the court to know that if at any time I thought that Jane was being abused, I would have been the first person to her rescue. But as the jury saw, and as we've known all along, she lied and continues to lie even now. In her own words, I have been lying my whole life. Well, that may be the only truthful sentence out of her mouth, end quote. Jane's attorney told the media that the verdict was unfair, saying, quote, Everybody thought that Dave Lout was a hero, but the honest truth is the only hero in the Lout household was Jane. She knows if she didn't do what she did, her and her child would be dead. Dave's sister-in-law fought back and told the star, quote, This was horrible for the real victims of abuse, and she painted an ugly picture that were just lies. I would like to apologize to all the real victims of abuse, because now it just makes it difficult for them to walk away from abuse when they have to. Jane was a desperate woman who was willing to say anything to try to get off. She lied so easily to everybody, and now she's tainted what other women are really going through, end quote. 
Of course, Jane appealed her sentence and conviction on many grounds, including that the court was in error when they didn't let her present expert testimony about the effect of battered women syndrome on her mental state at the time of the shooting. She said that if the jury had been able to hear that information, they would have understood that Jane did not have control over the reasoning part of her brain. She also brought up the misconduct on the prosecution side and said that it denied her due process and a fair trial. Jane's appeal was denied on September 30th, 2019. The appeals court brought up that a social worker had testified that a person, not Jane, but just a person in general, suffering from battered women's syndrome can lose executive function. The court said that because this expert was testifying for the defense, it would have been obvious to the jury that they were referring to Jane when they said that someone suffering from battered women's syndrome could lose executive function. Furthermore, the appeals court said that Jane didn't testify that the shooting occurred because she lost executive function. Instead, she testified that she was acting in self-defense and in the defense of her child. The court ruled that Jane's testimony lacked credibility and that she was asking the jury to believe that she was able to wrestle the gun from a former Olympic shot putter who was 6'3 and muscular. It didn't really seem probable. Furthermore, they noted that on the night of the shooting, Jane consciously hid the gun and changed clothing in order to bolster the intruder's story. But as soon as the police started questioning the story, she changed the version of events completely. Lastly, the court ruled that the prosecutor's misconduct was not so egregious that it denied Jane due process. The court said that the judge did a good job of telling the jury to completely ignore the prosecution's remarks regarding the defense's job. Jane is currently incarcerated at the Central California Women's Facility. She will be eligible for parole in 2032 at the age of 75. A group of family and friends that call themselves Team Jane is working to help her get clemency. They've started a Facebook page and have collected letters and emails to send to the governor. I do think that there was an advantage to having six years from the time this took place to the time of her trial. For I'm not sure. saying her defense coached her, but she had a lot of time, a lot of expert witnesses, a lot of experts she worked with. Like there was a lot of time to really work on her case, really. For sure. Much more than some people get. Yeah. So And I feel like whether or not, like, even without being necessarily coached, I feel like the longer you have just to kind of be comfortable speaking your story like that always is going to be an advantage the more time you have like with anything because not only can you like for sure I mean you can say you're being co I mean being coached obviously is one but um I just feel like in general like having more time like is an advantage whereas some people go on trial right away it's like only a year later and I just feel like I don't know not that necessarily yeah. that like the results are always wrong because the trial happened too soon but I don't know I just feel like right you can definitely say that six years is a long time yeah, very interesting story for sure. So that was the episode for this week. Melissa, are you ready to turn the page and move on to the last thing before we go? Mandy, I am. Um, I looked for a little game we could play that was Olympic related and decided to look up Olympic games that are no longer Olympic sports. So oh. kind of as you weren't sure about oh, this. I should be great at this. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. I am giving you multiple choice. And basically the answer is what year did this sport or this event last take place? So it's just, it's more of a guessing game than anything else. There used to be an Olympic event called the 200 meter obstacle race. So Mandy, this was a combination of a swimming event and an obstacle race. The competitors had to climb over a pole, scramble over a row of boats, and then swim under another row of boats. And this is done in like this river um, where the current could be different. It was really, Ooh. really weird. Um, so Mandy, what year did this event last take place? Was it 1900, 1904, 1908, or 1912? Oh my gosh, I'm like so bad because I literally was thinking it was going to be like a date like in the 1930s. So I had, I was already way Well, that's off. not that far off. At least you did. I thought you were going to say the 90s. I was no. Like, Mandy. Okay, so um, <laughs> let's say 1912. Okay, it was 1900, and it was the only time they ever oh, did this event because, oh, as you dangerous. can imagine, it was kind of <laughs> yeah right. Okay, so the next one is called plunge for distance, and this is like literally the thing you do as a kid, where you stand, you dive in the pool, but you don't move your arms. You know how like you have no, you're not trying to move your hands. Like, did you ever do those kind of races, like with? family friends or whatever where you stand there you dive in but you can't move so you just see how far your body naturally yes. takes you that's what oh, this wow. race was okay so they had it gave they had a minute time and they did it until either their head came out of the water or um 
<laughs> or the one minute came up, whichever was first. Sounds very exciting. Um, what year did this last take place? 1900, 1904, 1908, or 1912? 1908. 1904, but very close. And that was the only time they <laughs> did it. They um, were just experimenting <laughs> uh, with what, what we were going to put in the Olympics. Especially the early 1900s, they're like, I guess, let's yeah. just try this. Let's see what this is. <laughs> the next event is two-hand shot putt. And it's not as weird as it sounds. It's actually using um, using the same shot. You would throw it three times with your right hand, three times with your left hand. And then the distance of each hand is summed up to give a total distance. So the three finalists are also allowed to use three more ro- throws with their hands. So like you're already oh tired goodness. and they're like, <laughs> three more, please. <laughs> Use use each hand. So yeah, it's just a lot of throwing the shot putt. So Mandy, nineteen hundred, nineteen oh four, nineteen oh eight, nineteen twelve. Nineteen oh eight. Dang it. Okay, it was nineteen twelve. I'm so sorry, Mandy. You're <laughs> this isn't your fault. There's no reason you should know these. So this next one is rope climbing. And this is where you are laying on the ground, holding a rope and pulling yourself up only the top upper part of your body. Isn't that like something they used to make you do in like PE class, like climb the rope to the top? And that used to give me literal anxiety thinking I was going to have to try and do that because first of all, it's hard. Secondly, rope is also terrible. No. Oh my gosh. I have. Yeah. I'm nervous. I'm nervous already. I hope we stop doing this like very early on. And you're short. So it's going to be a (laughs) far way down. Let's see. So 1900, 1906, 1924, or 1932? 1924. 1932. But actually, it was held in all of those years. So you're kind of right, but it wasn't the last year. But all those years. So it stopped in 1932. So they did it for quite a while. All right. Last one, Mandy. Underwater swimming was, this is my favorite one. Basically, you only swim underwater. So imagine how exciting this is for everyone watching when you can't see anything like before cameras, everything. like they before they had like underwater cameras. Yeah. So this was held in 60 meters of water. Competitors are awarded two points for each meter you swim and one point for each second you stay underwater. So it is like <laughs> such like little kid rules. To right. Me. Like, isn't that something you would do in the in the pool? Be like, OK, you're going to get two points for each second. You don't come up. I felt like the other one you we just did was kind of the same way. The one where you what you just don't. You just swim and don't move. Right, exactly. I mean, you just dive like, and you don't sounds move. Like, these sound like games my kids make up to play in the summer when they're swimming in the pool. <laughs> right? Exactly. Okay, so last one, Mandy. 1900, 1924, 1932, or 1960? I'm going to say that one went on for a long time. Let's say 1960. Do you want to guess again? No, I don't. I want you to get one right. <laughs> 1924. Keep no. going. Go with the first one. <laughs> Six. 1900. 1900. It was 1900. Good it's job. It's weird that they stopped um, doing it. That I mean, because that's kind. 1900. They quit a lot of them. But that's they were kind like, of similar. I mean, it's basically like swimming now, like distances. Where obviously you don't do it underwater. You can breathe. But I mean, they've kind of just like adapted that, like idea. Yeah. But I love that this is like how strong are your lungs? Right. Which I would fail it miserably, but. I just love the idea that they're like, you, every every second you get two points. And if you do this, you get one right. point. And I don't know. It's just fun. That one. But they said like, yeah. Sorry. Cool. That one reminds me of what I used to do when I ha- um, was a kid and would be in a pool where you would try to see how many times you can swim back and yes. forth without coming up for breath. And like you would like have contests with your friends. I have memories of doing that. And there are some times when I'm like, I really should have come up. But I kept swimming. And I'm like, that was dangerous. It was stupid. So stupid. And my favorite thing was the first swim of the year because I always felt like my lungs were like at their best. And like the first one of the year, I'd always be like, I can't top this. Right. You can't get any better than this. And I would do so great. But yeah, that was I just remember going back and forth and back and yeah. forth. And that was like the whole thing you did. Yeah. Well, you could have been an Olympian, I could but have. not yeah. after 1900. <laughs> I feel like I feel like once we got out of that time period, I, my chance went down for pretty much everything yeah <laughs> same same but i think i could have been really good in like 1896 right yeah so mandy <laughs> kind of like she's a what do they say like i don't even know what they say like a she's like a walmart 10 but uh I, I need like a better i don't know if you heard that phrase like it's kind of like me well, with I've, sports i feel like like i would be like i'm like in 2023 i'm like a zero but in like 1850 i probably would have been oh you know <laughs> is this like i say i'm a 
I'm a Ferrari zero, but I'm a minivan seven because that's <laughs> yes, kind of my yes, thing. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Do pretty good. Yeah. yeah. I do pretty good for myself in that I'm van. I'm a 2023 <laughs> zero, but a 1900 hero. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. That was the episode for this week. We will be back next week. Same time, same place. New story. Have a great week. Bye.